Thank you very much, Liam. Thanks to all of you for giving up your time on a Friday afternoon to be here. Uh, so this is uh, basically an overview of a book. If, if you're interested in the topic, go out and buy the book or give me two tickets to the All-Ireland Final tomorrow. <laughs> you can show your appreciation in many different ways. Um, and the book starts with a description of one person, uh, Merle Mayo. Merle is um, shown here with her husband, Robert, and their son, Corbin. And her husband died on uh, September 11th. And we start the book by talking about her experience um, uh, dealing with a myriad of different challenges when she was trying to get support, life insurance, um, and I'll, I'll just read a little bit from the start of the book. In the days following his death, Merle spent countless hours finding out what financial resources she was eligible for, filling out forms, pulling together documentation, and dealing with officials who offered various levels of help and sympathy. Everything was scattered all over the place. And then when I thought about all the things I had to do and all the laundry that was overflowing from the hamper, I felt so overwhelmed that I broke down so badly I couldn't even catch my breath. I sat down on the floor just like, I have to do this, I have to cry now, and I did. But Merle Mayo remembered one application process as being refreshingly simple, and that was Social Security. Um, she just had to make one phone call and fill out one, on one online form, um, and if it was more convenient, she could have gone to one of a couple of thousand Social Security offices in the United States. Uh, and that process, worked really well for her and for lots of other people. The first uh, Social Security survivors checks were mailed out to victims' families by October 3rd, 2001, so less than a month after the event. It's a simple example of how we want government to work. A public agency offers a helping hand at a time when it's desperately needed. Uh, but too often, our experience of government is the opposite. Uh, we associate it with confusion, delay, frustration, and so our book project and the research project that's followed this is about these administrative burdens, how they affect citizens, how, and what governments can do uh, about it. And I think from your point of view, hopefully also what you, if you're in the business of research, can take from this and use it as a tool to engage in research to fix some of these burdens. So the outline of my talk will answer three brief questions. Um, first, what are administrative burdens? Second, why do they matter? And third, what can we do about them? This is a preliminary framework, uh, and there's much to do to fill in that framework, and we hope other people will join in the process of, of uh, completing the research agenda we lay out. Uh, our motivation for writing the book was also that we saw as uh, scholars of my part, public administration, and Pam Hurd's part as a social policy scholar, across lots of different policy areas, lots of different disciplines, similar types of phenomena occurring in terms of the barriers that people encounter when they engage with the public sector. But they tended to use different names and different terminologies, so partly we wanted to come up with a common set of language and concepts that could uh, communicate the same ideas across these different settings. Um, in particular, I think, for this audience, it's a way of thinking about how behavioral science intersects with policy, administration, and by extension, then, politics. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of U.S. examples in my talk today. So I, I'm from County Kerry, but I live in the U.S., and I have done for 20 years. And so my knowledge of public policy is fundamentally U.S.-centered. What I challenge you to do as I'm talking is to think about administrative burdens that you're familiar with in your work or in your life, in your research, and to think about how they fit with some of the characteristics I'm going to talk about. Um, one important caveat before I get too far on is to, to answer the question of whether burdens are always bad. And the answer is no. There's a range of possibilities. So the government has legitimate reason in some cases to impose costs upon citizens. Um, sometimes the benefits that are generated by those costs are not actually justified. And sometimes some of these burdens impose costs to solve problems that don't really exist. Our book is mostly about the second and third category of burdens, as, you, as you'll see as I, when I give you some examples. So first off, what, what are administrative burdens? Uh, a few years ago, uh, I snuck a definition into a paper where I was working with my co-author, Barry Burden, 
<laughs> so here's a trick for PhD students. Find a co-author whose last name is the same thing as the phenomena you're studying, <laughs> and then make them the first author of the paper. Um, and our definition was administrative burdens where individuals experience of policy implementation as onerous. And it can occur in any context that the state regulates private behavior or structures access to services. I'm a public administration scholar, so I care about these public sector burdens. Um, in our book, we build out uh, uh, the definition to define burdens in terms of three types of costs. Learning costs, compliance costs, and psychological costs. Uh, learning costs, you have to, say, find out about a public sector program you might want to sign up for. You have to engage in some search efforts, spend some time, figure out if you're eligible for it, what you would have to do, where you'd have to go, what sort of documentation you might have to pull together. We're not born with this knowledge. It's not innate to us, so it requires some time and effort on our part. Uh, an example of the role of learning costs and how they can be reduced comes from the Earned Income Tax Credit. So the Earned Income Tax Credit is a tax rebate that's targeted towards the working poor in the United States. Depending on how you measure things, it's the largest uh, targeted social program in the United States. Uh, it does pretty well in terms of take up. And one of the standard measures of uh, how burdensome programs are is whether people actually get the benefits that they want. So program take up is a sort of a good measure of that. About eight out of 10 people who are eligible for the program actually take it up. Um, but there are two things that are really interesting about this. A lot of people who are getting the program are unaware that they're eligible for it and might not be able to name the program, or they systematically underestimate benefits, and yet they're still getting the benefit. So one point is that learning costs exist here, even with a very large, very well-known program. Um, how do they end up getting the, the program, even though a lot of them don't know about it? Uh, their learning costs are reduced by two actors. One is the IRS. So the IRS will send out reminders to people that it believes to be eligible, and it's worked with uh, behavioral scientists to, to test which reminders are more or less effective. So what sort of language in here is most effective? Uh, they found that the inclusion of specific numbers in these reminders really increased participation. So you have a public actor helping to reduce learning costs. The other uh, actor that's reducing learning costs is the private tax preparation industry. So you go to H&R Block in the United States, you pay them hundred dollars, they'll fill out your tax for you and they will make sure that you get the benefit that you're eligible for. Um, so you still have to pay for it, there's some cost involved, but they're delivering for you um, a much higher knowledge about what you're eligible for. The second type of cost uh, are compliance costs and, and so these are the sort of standard things we associate with paperwork. Filling out forms, documenting your status, uh, recertifying your status on a regular basis, Maybe you have to spend money to hire a lawyer, or there's some fees that are involved. Uh, you might have to deal with informal bureaucratic requests. Uh, so this is uh, um, Abel Sewell. Uh, he is a six-year-old survivor of leukemia who lives in Tennessee. Um, and earlier uh, this year, his family found that they were no longer covered by the Tennessee version of Medicaid. So this is health insurance for the poor. Uh, what had happened? Uh, well, the state of Tennessee mailed out uh, renewal forms, uh, mailed out uh, about 330,000 of these forms to people who were on the program. Um, and uh, um, Abel's parents said we didn't get the form, which may or may not be accurate, but here's one thing that is true. If you're relying on people to renew their status through mail, a certain number of things are going to happen. Some mail will get lost, especially for families who move a lot. Um, if people are in bad financial conditions, they often don't open the mail that arrives in their mailbox. Uh, sometimes people will fill out forms erroneously. Um, sometimes they will not return them. Uh, and if any of those conditions happened, you lost health insurance in Tennessee. So over the course of a couple of years, uh, Tennessee uh, lost 220,000 children uh, in terms of health insurance. Uh, they send out about 320,000 mail communications, and only about 10% of those mail communications resulted in actual decisions. The rest of them 
uh, resulted in people losing coverage because they didn't return the forms or they returned it late or there were errors in the forms. And so I'm talking about this example partly to illustrate the fact that sometimes administrative burdens are not this marginal side problem, but are central to the scale of effects that we would worry about if we cared about getting people covered for something like health insurance. The third category of, of costs that we talk about in our book is psychological costs. And there are different flavors of psychological costs. So economists have long talked about stigma uh, of participating in unpopular programs. You might also experience a loss of personal autonomy or a, a sense of unfairness when you engage with public actors. Um, or you might feel some sense of stress in dealing with the compliance and learning costs or the risks that you might lose important benefits for your family. Uh, some of the best work on psychological costs tends to be ethnographic work uh, that really gets at how people experience the state. And so I'm going to illustrate psychological costs um, by quoting uh, this woman from Wisconsin, where I lived for many years, Rattel Frank. Uh, Frank was someone who had voted in every uh, presidential election since 1948, when Harry Truman was elected. Uh, but she was denied the right to vote and the right to register because Wisconsin passed the voter ID law. Uh, she did not have a birth certificate that qualified uh, uh, to get her uh, um, a new form of uh, valid ID. She would have had to pay a few hundred dollars to get a new form of birth certificate. Um, so she was denied the ability to register and therefore to vote. Um, and she talked about her experience here. Uh, and I think it's worth reading out. Uh, she, so she's talking about going to the Department of Motor Vehicles and trying to vote and being told she wasn't eligible. Uh, that really hurt. I've lived in the same house for 85 years. I've served on the village board for 18 years. And then they told me I wasn't going to be allowed to vote. I left the DMV and I thought, it just isn't right. I felt so downtrodden. It just felt like I wasn't as good as anyone else. So how do these burdens matter to types of policy outcomes we might care about. Um, so I'm going to talk about three big facts I want you to remember about administrative burdens. First, they're consequential. They have big effects, uh, ones that we may not really fully realize ahead of time. Um, and this occurs in a couple of different ways. So there are some interactions we have to have with the state, whether we like it or not. One of those is paying your taxes. Right? Uh, in the United States, the federal government estimates how much time people spend each year filling out forms. To fill out tax forms in the United States, people spend, uh, with our latest estimate, about 7.4 billion hours. Um, that is a lot of time, and arguably a lot of that is not necessarily a, a good use of time, because the government actually has most of that information that people are providing to it already. Right? So, uh, the government has generally your earnings income if you're paid by an employer and you, you're essentially reproducing that information and giving it back to the government. Uh, there are other models of doing this where the government could pre-populate a form that says here's what you, we think you earned last year, is this correct or not, and then you would just sign it and be on your way if that was accurate, or you could decide not to do that and fill out the traditional form. That would reduce those number of hours dramatically, but that is not how we do it in the United States. There are some interactions with the states uh, that are voluntary. There might be some benefit for us in engaging with them, um, but burdens can make us, it's such an onerous process that we decide to withdraw. And I've given you a couple of examples already. Uh, I'll give you a third example here. Uh, this is a, a, a graph about participation of eligible uh, uh, populations in food stamps, or SNAP, another very large uh, program targeted towards the poor. And you see this interesting sort of U-shape uh, that occurs from the mid-1990s until about 2014. So what happened in the mid-1990s? Uh, the short two-word answer to that question is welfare reform. So up until the, the mid-1990s, if you got cash welfare in America, something like uh, uh, TANF, uh, you automatically got SNAP. What happened with welfare reform was that the two things were delinked. Right? So there became, instead of one application process, two application processes. Two sets of learning costs, two sets of compliance costs, two sets of psychological costs. 
And you see this really dramatic uh, um, decline in participation because of that. Um, to their credit, the Bush and the Obama administration thought that this was a problem and did a variety of things to increase participation over time that worked pretty well. Primarily, the main thing that, that had the biggest impact was to implement what they called a categorical eligibility rule, which is they would allow states to use data um, from other applications you had submitted to the state to then put you on SNAP. So they effectively linked SNAP back to these other welfare applications. And so it becomes easier to enroll in SNAP again and participation increases. Currently, the Trump administration um, is proposing a rule that would once again delink the two and forbid states to use information from other welfare applications to enroll people in SNAP. And you can predict what's going to happen to the participation rate if that rule actually comes into play. Uh, another example of how uh, um, burdens have big effects on access and in some ways unusual and perhaps unanticipated effects uh, comes again from another uh, Trump administration policy. Medicaid, again, this is the largest wealth, uh, sorry, largest health program targeted towards the poor. Um, the Trump administration is encouraging states to require participants to demonstrate that they work at least something like 20 hours a week in order to get the health insurance. Um, the problem with this policy, there are many problems with this policy, but one problem with this policy is the population who are eligible for this benefit generally are already working. Most of them are already working. Those who are not working tend to have uh, severe disabilities or illnesses that prevent them from working. So there's, there's little real room for the policy to do much good. So what happens instead is that people who lose access to benefits here do so not because they're not working, but because they can't deal with the paperwork requirements. So this is an estimate by the Kaiser Family Foundation, which covers healthcare in the United States. Um, they, they came up with a variety of scenarios, but the big takeaway point is that in, in all of their estimates, they, they generally thought probably about four out of five people who lose benefits will lose benefits not because they're not actually eligible for the program, but because the paperwork is so onerous. Arkansas has been the only state that's actually implemented this policy. Um, other federal judges have put a stay on the policy uh, because uh, of arguments that they violated uh, 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 rulemaking processes. Um, and so we can look at Arkansas to see whether that prediction actually turned out to be true or not by the Kaiser Family Foundation, and generally it did. Uh, so this is uh, Elizabeth uh, Cloinger, and she is one of 18,000 people who lost uh, uh, Medicaid coverage under uh, this uh, new policy. And she is working, she is low income, but she didn't know that she had to document that low income to the state government. Um, Arkansas also made it particularly hard for participants because they uh, structured the reporting requirements so that they were online only. What that meant is that you have to be technologically literate and have access to a computer to fulfill the requirements. Of the Medicaid population, about one third of them do not have access to a computer. Uh, about four out of 10 don't use email. Um, so this is not a population who are gonna scan uh, uh, their salary information and upload it onto a website. Um, a New England Journal of Medicine article uh, just came out that surveyed people who had lost benefits. Um, and uh, uh, basically the takeaway points was, one, lots of people lost uh, benefits. 95% of those who lost benefits should have retained them, either because they were working or they satisfied some uh, um, exemptions. Um, and about one third of the people who lost benefits had no idea that the policy existed. Right. They just didn't know uh, it was going to affect them. So learning costs and compliance costs combined there to matter quite a bit. So the first big fact was that burdens uh, uh, are consequential. They matter a lot in sort of big ways. The second fact is that these consequences uh, do not fall evenly across the population, but tend to be distributive. So they hurt some people more than they hurt others. Um, and, and that's true for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, if you're a less advantaged group or a member of a low-income community, you tend to be more dependent upon government support uh, 
than if you're a wealthier person. And as to the degree that those programs are means tested, encountering administrative be burdens becomes part of your daily life. They also, these, uh, uh, um, these groups may be more subject to discretionary bias on the part of street level bureaucrats who act as the gatekeepers to services. So I'm going to give a couple of examples of discretionary bias here. Uh, this is a literacy test uh, that was uh, in the state of Louisiana in 1965. Um, in 1965, the Voting Rights Act was passed, and these forms of literacy tests were, were made illegal. Um, what's interesting about the test is some of the questions that were asked, and, and bear in mind, you can't get anything wrong or you won't be allowed to register to vote here. Right. So um, I'm looking for volunteers who will tell me how to spell backwards, forwards. If you don't like that, you can try to answer right, right from the left to the right as you see it spelled here. And so the purpose of the test is not to establish literacy. The purpose of the test is to give sufficient ambiguity to the street level bureaucrat who's administering the test that they can take the answers that they like from, say, a white sharecropper that they would not accept from a black citizen. Right? And so it's an example of how some of these burdens go through street level bureaucrats than the discretion that they have. We have uh, a more contemporary examples of this. So um, some audit studies one that was uh, published in APSR, uh, um, looked at uh, uh, emailing uh, local election officials around the United States and asking, what do I need to vote? And in one treatment, they sent it, the email from a white sounding name. In another treatment, it came from a Latino name. And Latinos tend to get fewer responses and tended to get less useful responses. They got lower quality information. Um, and we also uh, uh, know that uh, legislative staff who work for uh, legislators that proposed uh, voting ID requirements tend to be less likely to respond uh, uh, to emails from minority names than from uh, white names, suggesting there may still be some racial bias that's animating the implementation of some of these burdens. Um, and I've, I've been working on a paper about uh, street level bureaucracy and the use of discretion here. And so I've been sort of reading this literature. And uh, um, if you ask the question, do they use their uh, um, discretion to discriminate uh, across groups? In general, the evidence is mixed, but there's more evidence of discrimination than not. Um, and in particular, uh, in the United States, minorities are likely to face higher learning costs because they're less likely to get responses from uh, um, street level bureaucrats and higher psychological costs because they get less welcoming messages from street level bureaucrats. And I've been working on a, um, a project in, in Denmark uh, where we find evidence that Arab Muslim families face higher compliance costs when they interact with the state because they get asked more questions where they have to document their status relative to natives, native Danish names. So the other reason why uh, um, less advantaged groups may struggle more with administrative burdens and why burdens might reinforce inequalities is because of human capital differences across populations. And so here it's useful to uh, refer to an older literature on ordeal mechanisms that Richard Zeckhauser and others have championed. And Zeckhauser's argument is that burdens are actually an efficient way of rationing uh, scarce public services because people vary in how much utility they will derive from the service. If I really don't want health care, I'm not going to wait in the long line to get it. Uh, but Zach Heisler's model doesn't really take into account the idea that people also vary on other factors, including their human capital. And human capital can include your uh, uh, innate and acquired knowledge, education, personality, health, experiences, cognitive functioning. And you know, we, we saw a paper this morning that talked a little bit about if you have mental health problems, um, there's going to be a gap between your savings rates and others. Um, partly because there's variation in this, that particular form of human capital. 
Um, the catch-22 part of this is that groups with lower levels of human capital are generally going to be more in need of state support or help and going to be least able to overcome those burdens when they, that are, that are uh, um, put in front uh, of that uh, uh, types of help. Um, and so some nice examples of this coming from the area of voting. Uh, so a paper, again, with my friend Barry Burden, um, uh, we looked at variation in state laws and the effects that that had on voting. We lived in the state of Wisconsin where you could register to vote up to and including election day. Um, we compared states like that to states where uh, you couldn't register beyond something like 28 days before the election. Um, what we found was, not surprisingly, there's much higher rates of participation if you're allowed to vote, uh, allowed to register right up to election day. And that's partly because some people just are not interested in the election until the last minute. But if you decide then to, to go and vote and you haven't registered, you may be out of luck depending on which state you live. Um, further work that followed up uh, um, on this idea of, of, of registration making a difference established that these differences in laws affected some groups differently than others. So the people who benefit most from having election day registration tend to be lower income voters. And that's partly just because they vote, they, they, um, they move more frequently, right? So they have to update their status more frequently um, and making it more convenient for them to do that helps them to participate more in the electoral process. Uh, a, a terrific field experiment from France uh, 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 provided more causal support for this claim. Um, so the, uh, the treatment here was someone would come to your home, help you to register to vote, uh, there was another treatment where they just gave you information that encouraged you to vote. Uh, and they found that helping people to vote had uh, about a four percentage point increase in uh, um, getting people to, to, to vote. So just ha having someone fill out the forms to get you registered. Um, but the beneficiaries tended to be mo uh, uh, concentrated strongly among those who had uh, um, uh, less education, who were younger, who were immigrants, and who did not speak French at home. So maybe more marginal parts of the French community. Okay, so what, what is it we could, you know, hopefully at this point you're sort of enraged about administrative burdens, you're ready to run to the barricades, and you, you say, what, what can we do about all of these things? Right. Um, and I think that there's a variety of things we can do. Um, but as a starting point, uh, the fact that I'm talking here at a university, at an educational institution, I want to start by thinking about education because I firmly believe it doesn't matter how many papers I write, the biggest effect I'm going to have on the world is the students I train because they're the ones who will actually go work in the public sector and they're the ones who are going to be in position to make changes. So thinking first as, as changing things through my role as an educator I think is probably a, a sensible approach. And I take some inspiration from the evolution of cost-benefit analysis. Um, in the 1960s, cost-benefit analysis was a fairly obscure econometric technique. By the 1980s, it was a required practice in the US federal government. Increasingly, it's a standard part of the curriculum in any public policy school or public administration department in, in the United States, such that if you're a student in that area now, you graduate, you're familiar enough with the, with the, 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 the logic of cost-benefit analysis and you may actually be reasonably well-trained on the topic. Right. And so in my uh, um, uh, uh, most fantastic dreams, the same thing would happen with administrative burdens. That we would teach our students to think about costs and benefits that we impose upon individual members of the public. And I think cost-benefit analysis has been fantastically successful in getting governments to think about how they treat private organizations. Um, so that if you're in the United States, you're going to be affected by some sort of regulation. There has to be a formal cost-benefit analysis that is then reviewed by the White House. Right? There's very strong protections there to make sure there isn't onerous regulations imposed upon the individual. By contrast, what we do for individuals who are, impo who are experiencing burdens, we calculate how much time it takes for them to fill out forms. That's a much lower level of protection of the individual against these administrative burdens. Um, 
Cass Sunstein has argued for sludge audits, so the idea that organizations, both public and private, would on a regular basis look at the, the types of frictions they impose upon individuals and find ways to minimize those frictions. And I think that, that, that makes a great deal of sense. Um, I hope policymakers listen to that. Uh, but I think we also need to be realistic about the sources of uh, burdens before we can solve them. And in many cases, administrative burdens come from administrative and political choices. Uh, they're not found in nature. Sometimes these are choices not made, but ultimately choices that structure the way in which the state interacts with citizens. And in some cases, burdens are constructed deliberately to make programs less successful. And in particular, in our book, we, we provide a series of examples of where uh, political actors uh, um, have uh, attitudes about burdens that can be reasonably easily predicted when you look at their attitudes about the program that they're working with or the constituency being served by that program. Um, and one of the earliest papers we wrote on this topic just looked at the complexity of Medicaid form across the 50 states. So each state can do, do it slightly differently. And we found that the main predictive factor there was that there was unified Republican control of the state that led to more complex forms. Um, and in fact, burdens can actually be quite attractive as a form of policymaking. Um, and that's partly because of their opaque nature. They're, they're the details of administration. They're boring. They're hard to understand. If I'm talking to you about the categorical eligib eligibility rule for SNAP, your eyes start to glaze over very quickly. Right? It's hard to campaign about this stuff. So they're hard to understand, and often the executive branch or the, the whatever part of the government is in control of some of, the de of these details of administration can implement policy without going through parliamentary or legislative consultation. And so the Trump administration is sort of pivoting away from a series of failed legislative proposals that would have implemented more of these burdens and, and turning instead to the rulemaking process through the executive branch to put them in place instead. Um, and we've argued in a variety of places, in, in the Washington Post, the Hill, um, and in other places, uh, um, that these rulemaking processes that are not that obvious are going to have really, really big effects because they are going to have the, the types of effects that we saw when we were talking about Medicaid and SNAP earlier. Um, in fact, uh, um, we also argue that the best way to understand social policy in the Trump era is to look at the creation of administrative burdens. It's not on the legislative side where absolutely nothing is happening. It's, it's the, the imposition of these details within SNAP, Medicaid, Medicare. Going back to um, my example of tax reporting, you might think to yourself, well, the United States is a smart country. Why don't you have a simpler tax reporting system? Um, and there are two reasons for that, and they illustrate two different mechanisms by which burdens are constructed. One is ideological. Uh, there is strong ideolo ideological opposition by one political party to making um, taxes easier to report. Um, and this goes back to uh, something Ronald Reagan articulated uh, when he was governor of California. At the time, the California legislature was trying to pass automatic withholding. So the state government would take state taxes out of your paycheck, uh, as opposed to the traditional model of you would write a giant check to the state of California each year. And Reagan vetoed that because Reagan said taxes should hurt. People should feel the pain of pain. Because otherwise, people become more uh, welcoming of taxes. They, they, they regard it uh, um, uh, as, as, as less painful. Taxes sort of disappear, and so you become more tolerant. And so if you're uh, suspicious of state power, you may want to make the process of paying taxes as painful as possible. And Reagan's heirs uh, um, continue to keep that uh, um, uh, 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 ideological standard. They've been a strong opponents of simplifying the tax reporting system. Uh, the second opponents to, to um, reducing burdens here are the tax preparation industry. So remember earlier in the talk, I talked about how this, this 
these great people, the tax preparation industry, were helping to get poor people tax uh, refunds. They're also the strongest opponent of simplifying tax reporting because that's their business model. Right? Um, so the, the, the best illustration of this is that in the state of California, uh, they've experimented with having um, pre-registered tax forms. Um, and they, they've been doing it for like a couple of decades now, and they never get beyond doing it with like 0.5% of the population. It's something really small. Um, and that's because uh, Intuit, the, the, the maker of TurboTax, has spent millions of dollars in California politics to oppose the expansion of the policy. Other state governments don't want to engage in that fight. Um, and so uh, we have the situation where we have a less than optimal tax reporting system, um, partly for reasons of ideological opposition, but partly because of rent seeking. There, once you have a status quo in place, some actors might extract rents from the burdens that people endure. So if we get along to thinking about how to, how to reduce burdens, um, we can think about conditions where nudges are, are enough. And we, we talked a little bit this morning about when nudges can be helpful or not. Um, and I think nudges are quite helpful, and partly this depends on what you define as nudges. But nudges are helpful when your problem is one of learning costs, when people might not know something that they should know, or you can reframe how they think about the problem so they take a more positive approach to it. Um, this approach to, to fixing burdens is appealing because it's, it's not a terribly political one. Right? So when the, the UK government uh, experimented with different uh, types of letters to induce tax compliance and get people to pay their taxes on time, there wasn't a big political battle about that. Right? Um, these are uh, design choices that are made relatively downstream in the political process. An incredibly powerful type of nudge is changing the default. And so many of us are familiar with the idea of changing the uh, um, uh, pension sa saving systems from opt-in to uh, uh, opt-out. Um, and in the United States, we've also been experimenting with that in, in, in uh, certain policy areas. Um, some states have moved towards automatic registration for voting. So they will take your um, information from the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles and will register you to vote if it looks like you're eligible. Um, but th that policy has been adopted only in states that have democratic control. And so it's been solidly opposed if you have a Republican governor. Um, part of the point here is that uh, changing the default can be such an important and powerful nudge that in some policy areas it's going to face strong political opposition. There are also going to be cases where nudges are not enough, right? and, uh, um, and you need something else. And for want of a better term here, I'm going to call that something else help. You need someone who will help you walk through the process. Uh, so this is going to be the case in situations where information itself is not enough, getting the text is not enough, because there's still lots of compliance costs that have to be satisfied. And the most famous example of this from the US set, uh, um, setting is FAFSA, which is the application process to get a loan if you're in higher education. Uh, it's a famously complex process, and it was a really uh, um, important uh, um, experiment about uh, uh, how to increase uh, enrollment in FAFSA. Uh, by uh, Bargavi and Manoli in 2015, I think, um, where they tried different treatments. And one of the treatments is they told families who were eligible for this program, hey, you're eligible, here's the form, go fill it out. Another treatment is that they helped people to complete the form. Telling people they were eligible did not in increase participation in FAFSA or didn't increase college enrollment. Helping people to complete the form increase not just participation at FAFSA, but at the number of students who actually ended up going to college. So something like 36% college participation versus 28% uh, of a control group. So sometimes help is what you need. And again, we sometimes intuitively know this as, as, as policy actors with the Affordable Care Act in the United States. Part of the design of the act 
was uh, um, to set money aside for uh, what are called navigators. So these are people who will help you enroll in healthcare. Um, and it's necessary because the American healthcare system is so complicated and so onerous that most people will not be able to manage it by themselves. Um, in our book, we talk about a series of surveys that provide fairly persuasive evidence that navigators increased participation and were especially helpful to low-income and minority uh, people seeking health care. Um, and the Trump administration has eliminated the budget for navigators. Um, so another example of where uh, an effort to actually reduce burdens is going to be eliminated um, because of a preference for a more dysfunctional uh, approach towards government. Um, the last thing I'll say about help is that help can come directly from the government or it could be provided by third-party actors who, who might have an interest in increasing participation in education or welfare uh, uh, programs uh, or voting, as, as the case may be. Um, I think there's a fascinating set of opportunities here to think about how information technology can play a role in helping. Right? And so this is... Um, the results of an experiment uh, uh, that uh, I think you can find in NBAR, where they looked at take up for uh, a student debt program in the United States. So again, you go to college in the United States, you have to pay fancy professors like me, you rack up tons of student debt, and then afterwards you think, how do I reduce that? Uh, well, you can apply to a federal government program where you pay back um, your, your debt as a percentage of your income rather than uh, um, nominal payments. And for most people, that's a better financial deal. Um, and so even though this is a highly educated population, almost by definition, they've had real problems with participation. Participation of the eligible population is about 24%. Um, and so they piloted this experiment that would just make it simpler, uh, which was to pre-register. They already know who these people are. So they pre-registered a form with their information, emailed it to the person and said, you just have to click here to sign this and then you're eligible and you will get the benefit. Doing that generated this extraordinary increase in participation from 24% in the control group to just about 60% in the treatment group. Really enormous changes. The final way of thinking about how to get rid of burdens is just to think about um, how to design programs so that they work well in the first place. And so I've said so many negative things about the American welfare state. I'm going to end on a positive note, which is to talk about Social Security, a program created in the 1930s. Um, if, if you're uh, familiar with political science writings about bureaucracy, you might have read about Social Security in James Q. Wilson's book, Bureaucracy, where he talks about it as a production agency that has this really simple task of mailing out checks to members of the public. And we argue in our book, he completely uh, um, mistakes the complexity of Social Security as a program. When this program was created in the 1930s, so A, it's the midst of the Great Depression, they had about uh, uh, 18 months to enroll 26 million people into this pension system. The only previous model for this in the United States was the pensions for after the, the Civil War, which was such a corrupt, broken system that it sort of chased off the possibility of any other type of pension system for another 50 or 60 years. Um, and they didn't really have the administrative capacity to do a lot of this stuff. Uh, at the time, one newspaper called Social Security the biggest bookkeeping organization in the world. Um, they, they brought experts over from Europe to try and advise them about how to design Social Security. And some of them said, well, you can't do it. Uh, but they figured out a way. And some of the ways that they, 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 they did so were incredibly thoughtful in thinking about the world through the lens of administrative burdens. They may not have used that language at the time, but in the chapter, we talk and we'll pull quotes from the people who designed the programs that show that they were really thinking about how do you make this experience as frictionless as possible? How do you shift burdens away from the citizens and onto the state? So one example of that is that one possibility that they explored was that people would have stamp books, right? So to get your pension, you would have to, over the course of your career, uh, have these stamp books where every quarter 
your employer would give you a stamp saying how much you earned and you would keep those books and then when you turned 65 or whenever you would give that to the government and then the government would give you a pension. And as I'm saying this, you can probably think about all of the ways that would have gone wrong, right? You lose the book, or you create a black market for these stamps, or employers withhold stamps to, to punish employees for some reason. Right. And so instead, they came up with the idea of giving everyone in the workforce a number, the social security number, which is uh, um, still the only way in which we have a single unique identifier for Americans today. We do not have a national ID system. Right? This is still the, the state of the art when it comes to tracking Americans. And at the time, it was incredibly controversial, but it worked. It worked incredibly well to, to shift these reporting burdens away from the citizens so that when they retire, all they have to do is remember their social security number when they fill out a form to get their benefits. Some other things that the Social Security Administration did was to be accessible. They had thousands of field offices around the United States. When people visited those field offices, uh, the, the people that, that greeted them were trained to think about members of the public not as welfare claimants, but as citizens who had earned a benefit. And they were expected to provide what we would call today customer service, but basically treat people uh, civilly, respectfully, and helpfully. Um, so it's not that Social Security is a simple program. It's a complex program that was designed to feel simple. And it's for that reason today it still remains sort of the benchmark for a successful American welfare program that has survived multiple efforts to, to damage it. So I am going to stop there and take your questions, comments. Thank you very much.